Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well and of course Arnie does too. In today's video I will be focusing on the beautiful state of Texas. As Texas is almost three times larger than the UK, it has plenty of space for wildlife. There are plenty of predators such as wolves, cougars and even ocelots. And Texas is also home to the largest bat colony in North America. But just like many other states across North America, Texas also has some problem invasive species. I do get requests to cover different states in the US in these videos, but it is quite a tricky thing to do. As states are just imaginary lines that we use to divide the US. Many different states share the same invasive species, and most of the problem invasive species in Texas have already been through in other videos, such as the Barbary sheep, the Axis deer, the monk parakeet, the starling, and the wild boar. So in this video I will be covering some of the lesser known invasive species in Texas, as I'll be going through five problem invasive species in Texas. And for our first species we'll be heading to Cuba and the Bahamas, as we have the brown anole. These small lizards are less arboreal than some of their other family members, and tend to be found in low vegetation or on the ground. In these areas, they feed on pretty much anything they can fit into their mouth, and prove to be expert arthropod and isopod hunters. But some brown anoles are known to have a more adventurous diet, and will feed on other small lizards and their eggs. When it comes time to mate, male brown anoles can be very vibrant and very aggressive. They have a flap that extends below their neck, and they use this to woo possible mates. If this flap doesn't do the job, it's known to engage in a little dance by bobbing its head, which some females find to be irresistible. Although this species was originally native to Cuba and the Bahamas, it's now been introduced into many other countries around the world, and today is one of the worst invasive lizards. The brown anole was first documented in the Florida Keys in the 1880s, and it had become fully established in Florida by the 1940s. It's thought that their eggs may have been transported to the US in live plant shipments, and some individuals were thought to be escaped pets. They quickly expanded throughout the southern US, and today some of these lizards now call Texas home. Brown anoles are known to outcompete and consume native lizard species, and are normally the dominant lizard species everywhere where they're found. They've caused a significant reduction in green anole populations, and are also known to transmit parasites and diseases to other reptiles. So far there are very few management strategies in place to stop their spread, and so far it's been left up to the native predators. So these small feisty lizards have had a massive negative impact on their native reptiles. But for our next species, we'll be heading over to Japan, as we have the Sika deer. This species can be found over large parts of East Asia, but is most common in Japan. They're found over varying types of woodland, as well as uplands and moorlands. In recent years, Sika deer have become overpopulated in Japan, with their thought to be over 3 million individuals. The word seeker comes from the Japanese word for deer, so essentially this deer is called the deer deer. This species is a medium sized deer, standing around a meter tall at the shoulder. Their coat changes with the seasons, and they can look very similar to fallow deer in the summer, and they look very much like red deer in the winter. Seeker deer feed on a wide variety of grasses, as well as some shrubs and shoots. The seeker deer population is growing in both numbers and range. They've been introduced into many countries around the world, and in areas with no natural predators, their numbers soon become out of control. Sika deer were introduced into Texas for game food, as Texas has a very lucrative hunting industry. They had become established by 1988, with free range populations reaching over 11,000. These invasive deer are known to compete with the native white-tailed deer, and as they're closely related to both the white-tailed deer and the red deer, they're even able to hybridize with each other. This hybridization has negative impacts on the native deer, and can lead to reduced species diversity. As Sika deer are also very aggressive for they are known to cause significant damage to vegetation, and they also cut back the growth of woodland. Today you are legally allowed to hunt this species in Texas, and their population is monitored so they don't spread any more than they have. So although this is a very pretty deer species, it does have some negative impacts on the Texan ecosystem. But for our next species, we can head to pretty much all warm temperate zones around the world, as we have the cattle egret. This large white bird is often associated with wetlands, where it nests in colonies, usually with other wading birds. This bird got its name because they often accompany cattle and other large mammals. In most cases, the mammals see these birds as a welcome guest, as they often feed on flies and parasites that bug these mammals. The cattle egret is a stocky heron, and reaches an average size of around 50 centimeters long. Almost all the animals that I've covered in these videos are now invasive because of humans, but this is not the case with the cattle egret, as their invasion is completely natural. Although it was only originally native to some parts of Asia, Africa, and Europe, it has undergone a rapid expansion in its distribution, and has successfully colonized much of the rest of the world in the last century. Its introduction into the Americas was a natural migratory event, and they were first found in South America in the 1870s. By 1917 it was in Colombia, and by the 1940s it had reached Florida. They eventually entered Texas in 1954, and seemed to be very happy in their new home. 
As they feed on pests and parasites, they're seen as a very positive species to have around, but they can have a few negative impacts. They don't have an impact on native heron species as it has a different diet, but they are known to feed on eggs of other wetland birds, and are known to compete with other insect-eating species such as frogs, toads, and skinks. They're also known to cause hazards at airports, and can have damaging effects on aquacultural industries. But so far, their impacts are very small, and I'm sure cattle are very happy that they're around. But for our next species, we'll be heading to the freshwaters of Europe, as we have the European eel. For a large period of time, the European eel's life cycle was completely unknown. Eventually, it was discovered that they spawn in the Sargasso Sea, and eventually swim all the way to European shores as elvers. In their freshwater habitats, they eat anything from fish to mollusks and crustaceans, and will even scavenge dead animals. On this diet, they can reach a maximum size of around 1.5 meters, but European eels this size are very rare today. Although these eels are invasive in Texas, they are also critically endangered across the world. Since the 1970s, European eel numbers are thought to have declined by around 90%, and so far it's been very hard to find out why. Although these eels are endangered, they're not welcome in the US. This is because the US has its own species of freshwater eel, and this eel is also in some trouble. These eels also migrate to the Sargasso Sea to breed, and their fry make their way to the US on ocean currents. These eels are slightly smaller than their European cousins, but have a very similar lifestyle. These European eels not only compete with the American eels, but are also known to transmit parasitic nematodes, and these nematodes are thought to be one of the reasons why eel numbers are declining worldwide. Today, their numbers are monitored, and if you catch a European eel in Texas, you should not release it back into the wild. So although this species is in big trouble, it really shouldn't be in the US. But for our next species, we'll be heading to South and Central America, as we have the green iguana. The green iguana is an arboreal, mostly herbivorous species of lizard, with a very large geographical area. In some areas, they're known as the bamboo chicken, or the chicken of the trees, as they're very happy way up in the treetops. Although they can reach a very respectable two meters long, they still are targeted by some predators, as hawks and owls are known to target them, and they are known to have some extreme escape strategies, as in some cases, when they hear hawks, they will simply dive towards the ground, and they have been known to survive falls of around 50 feet. Green iguanas are very popular in the pet trade, but as these lizards can grow so large, they often prove too much for many pet owners to handle. In many cases, people then release their iguanas into the wild, where they can have major effects on the ecosystem. Green iguanas are most famously invasive in Florida, where they were first reported in the 1960s. In Texas, they slowly worked their way up from Mexico, and in southern Texas, they've been established since the 1990s. These iguanas are known to totally take over ecosystems. For instance, in Puerto Rico, iguanas overran the island, and have quickly displaced many native herbivores. They're also known to have an effect on butterfly numbers, as they eat many of the native plants in which they lay their eggs. These iguanas have also been observed invading the homes of burrowing owls. So although they're very interesting large lizards, they really are a big problem invasive species. But that's about it for this video. If you have any other areas that you want me to cover in these videos, then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.